morning, East Point Church. How are you guys? Yeah, you ready? All right, look at the buzzing and the connecting. I love our church, man. It is so good to belong to this faith family. Go ahead and open up your Bibles, please, to the book of Deuteronomy. The book, you should have said, wow? To the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All right? And so as you turn there, I'm just curious, how many of you in this room, how many of you hearing the voice of my body in your ears right now, how many of you have ever run a race? Come on. You're like, I was seven, and it was around the school. Bill, it's, hey, that counts. Come on now. How many of you have ever run a race? All right, cool. So, so for those of you who haven't, let me break it down real quick, all right? So the object of a race is to get from point A to point B as fast as you can, all right? You're like, oh, I do that every time the donuts are right. Yeah, that is you're racing to the donuts, right? You are racing to the bathroom, right? You are moving as fast as you can. So you, we're familiar now. We're caught up. You know what a race is. Well, let me tell you this. There are races, and then there are relay races. Have you ever competed in a relay race? See, when I was in high school, I did the four by four, right? We used to say, that's the race that separates the boys from the men, right? That's how we said it as 16-year-olds, you know? But you see, the object of a relay race, it's not simply to complete the race as fast as you can. The object of the race is to run your leg of the race and then to make a successful handoff to the next person. Easier said than done, right? Because you've got to understand, after running 400 meters as fast as you can around the track, when you come around that last corner, your legs feel like jello, right? So you could hardly stand, let alone run. And there's this weird thing that happens when you're straining and all the muscles in your neck, you're just like, like you just can't move. You know? And so you're already at a disadvantage. But then it gets harder because as you approach the handoff zone, the person you're trying to hand it to, do you know what they're doing? They're, roof, they're going further. They're trying to get a running start. And you're just like, come back, come back. And it's just, man, it is easier said than done. That handoff is difficult, which is why we practice the handoff. We always practice the handoff. And so we just did this thing. We were kids, right? Make fun of, make fun of us, if you will. But we would sleep with our baton. So literally, we'd sleep with it just because we wanted like, there to be a groove in our palm of like, there's no way to get, we just were comfortable with the baton. And then what we would do is we would coordinate. We knew how we were going to intersect in the hallways in between classes, and we would see each other, and we would just... <laughs> and we'd literally pass off the baton in between. We thought we were so cool, man, because we were, all right? And so we'd pass off the baton. We'd go to track practice, right? And we would literally run in circles, us four, like in a big box, just to practice the handoff. Practice the handoff because we realized the more we practice handing it off, the less likely the chances were that we would drop the baton. You see, the worst sound in the world for a relay race runner is the sound of the baton hitting the pavement. The sound of the baton bouncing off the track and the sound of victory vanishing with it. It's a relay race. See, I'm using this this morning as a metaphor because right now in this room, we're all running. Right now in this room, we as a community of faith, we are engaged in a leg of a race that I call, not a relay race, I call it the gospel race. You see, the good news of Jesus Christ has been passed down from disciple to disciple who makes disciple around the globe for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years, the baton of the gospel has been passed from one generation to another. And so the Lord is saying to East Point Church this morning, the Lord is saying to you, friend, will you pass the baton? Will we pass the baton? Will we prioritize a successful handoff of the gospel from the current generation to the next? So you see, if you go to a track meet, it's, it's kind of ironic because all eyes are on the current runner. All eyes, all of the cheers, all of the attention is focused on the lady, focused on the dude as they come around that last corner into the final stretch. All eyes are on the runner. But guess where the runner's eyes are? 
the handoff zone. The handoff zone. Their eyes are locked on the next person. Their eye, they're trying to make eye contact with the person they're going to hand it off to. You cannot do a successful handoff without being locked on that handoff zone. And so same way, all eyes are on East Point Church right now, on you in this room. You're leading. You're doing ministry. You're making it happen. You're leading your families. You're out there right now advancing the gospel in your circles of influence. But as all eyes are on you, the Lord is calling us, where are your eyes? It's on the handoff zone. Do you think that this leg of your race will last forever? Or are you already preparing to stretch it out? And you see, the Lord, through his word this morning, is going to teach us, friends. God calls the community of faith to pass on the faith. God calls the community of faith. It's a team effort. It's a community endeavor. He calls us to pass on the faith. And so this is a mark of maturity. We believe, according to the scriptures, that a mature follower of Jesus prioritizes passing on the faith. A mature community of Jesus followers understands that when they see kids running around the lobby and kids bumping into them with their coffee and, and kids, Mr. Sam, Mr. Sam, Mr. Sam, Mr. Sam, you know, like, what? No, 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 no. Mature followers of Jesus go, hey, 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 that's what it's all about. Mature followers of Jesus know that these are our kids, not your kids, not her kids, not their kids, our kids. And with this our kids mentality, mature followers of Jesus lock their eyes on that handoff zone. They lock their eyes on this upcoming generation and they make it their aim to not drop the baton. And so are you ready to pass the faith? Are you ready to pass it on, church? Are you ready to see another generation grab that baton? And they're already moving. They're already getting a head start. And we're, yeah. But God's word is going to help us today, okay? And so we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And let me just lay the framework for you, okay? Because in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we find a guy named Moses. All right? And so let me catch you up on the race. Moses has just led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. They are wandering for 40 years, not because they're lost geographically, but because they're lost spiritually. And they're moving. And they are on the cusp of the promised land. But Moses knows they are about to walk where his race will never lead. He won't step a single foot in the promised land. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses is speaking to the community of faith and with his final words in the Pentateuch, he's reaching and he says, community of faith, pass on the faith. Before you go, before you move on, before the next phase of this baton is carried, I want you to know community of faith. Here's what you need to know. And it's in this posture that he gives us the following in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let me read these 12 verses to you, and then we'll go back and break them down. Listen to this. This is God's word for our church, okay? Now, this is the commandment. The statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you. And that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, 
to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is God's word for his church this morning. So we're in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look at those first three verses again. He begins like this. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the lands to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be long. Hear then, O Israel. It's like, listen up, hear this. All right. Be careful to do them that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Let's pause there. The first thing we see in this passage, God gives his commandments to get after our hearts. God gives his commandments to get after our hearts. We see it here. God has shown up to Moses and he's given him commandments, right? He uses some synonyms, statutes and rules and instructions. In other words, God has given his word and his ways, okay? These are not holy FYIs that Moses got on a mountain. You know, hey, noted, yeah, keep those in mind. No, no, no. These are instructions, These, in these words, we find God's nature revealed to us. Here is what he is like, and here's how we can live in this unique relationship with the creator. And so God, he commands Moses. He doesn't suggest it. Hey, you might want to pass these on. No, he commands Moses. Teach them. Teach them how to live when they get into the land. Gather the assembly and instruct them, Moses the teacher. That way they will be careful to do them. Be diligent. Apply yourselves to his word and his ways. How do you think Israel felt about having God's word and ways? (sighs) Fine. I guess we can do those things in the land, right? Oh, okay, we'll follow your rules. No, not at all. Israel treasured these things. They said, whoa, this is a gift. They loved it and delighted in it so much that they wrote poetry to it. Listen to this, Psalm 119. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. He says, in the way that you delight in chocolate cake, mm, God's word is good. I love God's ways. I treasure them because they teach me how to be in relationship with my creator. And so this is a good thing. God has given his instructions. God has given his ways, his word. But here's what I want you to notice. What is the purpose of giving these commandments? What is his desired outcome? What is the end toward which he is moving his people Look at this, friends. He calls us diligently to do them. Why? That you may fear the Lord your God. That you may fear the Lord your God. God has given his instructions not to move our feet in mindless obedience, but to move our hearts in a Godward orientation. He's giving us these instructions because as we walk in them, they will train our hearts. They will orient our minds toward him, and we will be living a Godward lifestyle. God has no interest in a people who (sighs) meticulously and technically follow the rules, but whose hearts are far from him. He says, I want a people who love me with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. I want a people who fear God the Lord. Now, when you hear this phrase, fear the Lord, he's not meaning the way that you would fear an abusive person. To fear the Lord is not the way, you know how you walk on eggshells around someone because you're just like, dude, I don't know what today is. You know? No, 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 not that kind of fear. This is not walking on eggshells. Here's my definition of fear the Lord. We take God seriously. 
We walk in awe before him. Our attitudes, our posture toward God is marked by a deep reverence, not a flippant familiarity. It's just God. That's just God. Hey, God, yeah, it's just God. We are living our life in such a way that we say, hey, the creator of the universe, the most powerful being in all of the cosmos has initiated relationship with me. That's not lost on me. That is not lost on me. And so I'm going to live my life in a way, I'm going to live my life in a way that says God is a big deal. I live my life in a way that I acknowledge this is the Lord, this is Yahweh that we're dealing with, and he calls me beloved child. Dude, fear of the Lord is so important that the Lord also says in Proverbs 1-7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want to live a good life? You want to live a successful life? Do you want to live life right? Well, here's what he's saying. Your world's view, you can't even begin to form your world's view until taking God seriously is the cornerstone around which everything else in your life revolves. You're not even close to building a successful life if you don't first establish and plant. God is a big deal. Everything else pivots off of that. That's the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. And that's what God wants. He goes, I want a people who fear me. He says, this is the path. When you walk into the land, this is how I want you to walk all the days of your life. I'm not sending you into the promised land so you can say, thanks a lot, we'll take it from here. He says, I'm bringing you so that you would walk in a relationship before me that says, God is with me. Church, do we fear the Lord? When was the last time somebody asked you, right? So I'm not saying this accusingly. I'm asking us, let's take a good look in the mirror. Do we fear the Lord? Or do we relate to God with this flippant familiarity? Do we walk in awe and reverence the fact that it's not lost on us, that it's God we're dealing with here? Or is it just a casual take it or leave it attitude? Not accusing, I'm just asking, right? We need to look in the mirror and say, When was the last time we stoked the awe and wonder in our hearts? Is our heart filled with awe or is it casual? Lord, forgive us for our casual attitudes. Create in us a deep awe. Cure our hearts of the over-familiarity that takes you for granted. May we walk before you in holiness and honor and reverence. Lord, may it be said of us, they fear the Lord. Amen. And so God's addressing this generation. He's talking to you in this room. He's addressing those who are standing on the riverside about to cross over. But as you listen to him, do you hear his generational perspective? Can you see it in your text? Can you see it in the words? Look what he says. He says, yes, I want you. Yes, I want you to fear the Lord. Yes, I want your heart. But your heart is not the only heart I want. There's another. Yes, there's another. There's a lot of others. Your heart is not the only heart that he wants. He says, I want you and your son and your son's son. He says, I'm teaching you these things in such a way so that way it's not just you who fears me, but that your children would fear me. My plan is that your relationship with me would be like your most treasured inheritance passed down from one generation to another. As you're working up your will, parents, as you're working on your last will and testament, the most valuable thing you can pass on to your children, teach them how to be in relationship with their creator. He says, that's my plan. That's what I'm doing here. He says, I want you to realize this is a relay race, not a race. It's a relay race. And so he draws our attention forward with his generational perspective. But then look what else he does. He almost draws our attention backwards too. He says, hey, don't forget here, I'm the Lord, the God of your fathers. He's zooming out in such a way that says, hey, don't forget, I've dealt with your forefathers before you. Hey, don't forget, you may walk in the promised land, but you will be walking in answers to prayers that were prayed yesteryear. 
You, East Point Church, are living right now in a, in, a, in a dispensation of grace and favor that was prayed in 250 years ago when the first follower of Jesus set foot on this land. He's zooming us out, a generational perspective. See your place in a redemptive context. You, it is bigger than your generational moment. What he is doing is bigger than your leg of the race. It is bigger than us, friends. God hasn't gathered us here together to create a few spiritual moments. He is building a family to create a spiritual legacy that will be handed down from generation to generation to generation. We're building this for our kids. God calls the community of faith to pass on the faith. Do you want that? How many, I'm just curious, how many of you in this room you inherited faith from your parents. I'm just curious. Are you grateful for that generational impact? Are you grateful for that generational perspective that they had? How many of you in this room, maybe you're, how many of you would say, hey, I'm the first generation follower of Jesus and I'm starting a new family tree. Anybody like that? There it is, man. And so whether you've inherited or whether you're starting it, the call is the same. Pass it on. For those of you who are your first generation follower of Jesus, you are literally changing the trajectory of your family tree. Generation upon generation upon generation. So this is what God is calling us to do. The community of faith is to pass on the faith. And so how do we do it? <laughs> how do we create a generational legacy of the gospel and of faith? Look at the next few verses. Verse 4 says this. Hear, O Israel... The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as, as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. In other words, number two, permeate your heart and your home with God's word. Permeate your heart and your home with God's word. How many of you have um, flown recently? Anybody fly in an airplane? Okay. Do you guys still listen to the flight attendant up front doing the Macarena? No, I just like plug in my headphones and I'm like, I get it, all right? But how many of you still listen? I'm just curious. Anybody? You're so nice, right? You're the nice people. And they just, but when you listen, it's kind of disturbing because like, hello, if we go down in a crash over the Atlantic, just pull down that little mask and there's a flotation device that will probably not save your life as we crash into the ocean at 100 miles per hour. You know, and with a smile, I'm like, this is dark, you know? So I don't listen to that junk anymore. I'm going to put my headphones in. But if you were to listen they would say something interesting. At some point, they would say, hey, in the event that there's no more oxygen on the plane because the hyperbaric chamber has been broken, you know, grab that little mask and make sure you put it on yourself first before your kids. Isn't that, yeah, right? Isn't that kind of counterintuitive, right? Wouldn't you think, dude, I'm going to lay down my life for my kids. I'm going to take care of my kids first. I'm going to make sure that my children, I'm going to make sure that my neighbor, make sure that my fellow man is secure, and then I'll look out for myself, right? That's what you would think is the right thing. You see, what the captain understands, what the, flight is, what the stewardess understands is that the best thing that you can do for your neighbor is to make sure that you yourself are stable and secure first so that you're in a position to help them. In the same way, before Moses ever mentions our children in these verses, before he ever talks about passing on the faith, he looks at us and he says, you need to make sure that your heart is fixed and filled with fear of the Lord. You need to be right before you could even think about helping your children. He says, hear me, you need to hear this, adults. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. One of one, exclusive, distinct, and unique. There is no other Yahweh in the, crea in the, in the creation. He is it. And so serve him as number one. Put him above all else. There is no other God to turn to. The list is small and unique. One God. Serve him above all else. Love that God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. 
Love him with your heart. Put his word on your heart. You, friends. You see, we can't lead our children where we ourselves have never gone. We can't pass off to our children what we ourselves never had. We are going to pass on to our children who we are way more than what we know. And so God is saying, you, do you love the Lord your God with all your heart? Watch your own heart. Is it filled with love for the Lord? Check your heart. That's where he starts. But now here's what's really cool. Notice the the increasing circle of influence. He says, I want love to be in your heart. And then he expands the circle and he says, and I want you now to focus on your home. Look what he says here. He gives us three verbs, right? He says, you shall teach them. You shall talk of them. You shall bind them, right? When I was doing that, anybody else have bop it with their kids? I hear that in my sleep. It's like, bop it, bah, twist it, ah, pull it, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what my, he's like, teach it, talk it, bind it. Ah! I just, I'm telling you, I see things, right? But his, his point, the reason why he's doing this, he's not creating a checklist for like, step one, teach. Step two, talk. Step three, bot. No, he's using hyperbole here. Like if Moses were here today, he'd be like, eat it, sleep it, breathe it, drink it. Tattoo it on your eyelid. Like, that's the point of what he's doing here, okay? And so uh, you, you may even, when you're studying the Bible, you may hear about phylacteries and things that they wore on their clothes and little things that they put on their, on their house. I grew up in New York, you know, so Hasidic Jews would have, like, the little box. That's all post-biblical Judaism. So, like, that's not what Moses was instructing. They eventually, it's pretty cool, they took a figurative, metaphorical hyperbole and they made it literal, which, awesome. The more symbols, the better. But just for context, he's using hyperbole. He's like, just permeate your home. Like, you know when you go to Starbucks and you're there for like 20 minutes and for the rest of the day, everybody around you knows you were there for 20 minutes because they can smell you because coffee is just permeating? That's what I want in your life for scripture. That's what I want in your life in your home. People walk in, they go, God's word and God's ways. And so look what he says. Look at these verbs. He says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. There is space. There is a place for formal instruction. And I just imagine the people sitting in the audience going, who's teaching them? My name's not Moses. You're the teacher. You know, like I'm bringing them to temple once a week, Moses. That's, hey, don't try to delegate. That's your job, right? He goes, no, no, no. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You see, parents are the primary disciple makers in their home. It's your responsibility. We partner with you, no doubt. Our kids workers upstairs, pastors, teachers. It's a partnership, no doubt. But it's you. You're the primary, the first disciple maker. And so again, maybe you're sitting here going, I'm, what am I supposed to teach? I'm new to this thing. What am I supposed to, I'm not Moses. I don't have a PhD behind me. I, how can I possibly teach? Well, listen, listen, listen. That's why they're still sitting under Moses. Because they can only pass on what they've received. If you want to teach, if you want to pass on formal instruction, you better receive from Moses before you try to teach what Moses gave you. You don't need to be 15 steps ahead of your kids. You just need to be one. What did he teach you this week? Tell them that. What did you learn in the sermon? Take notes. Tell them that. You don't need to pretend like you have degrees that you don't for your kids. Just tell them what you're learning. You want to know what the Lord taught me this week? You want to know what I read in Moses? You want to know what I heard from Pastor Sam in the sermon? You want to know what the Lord spoke to me in my Devo? Pass it on. He says, teach them. You shall teach them diligently. Bust out some whiteboards, right? Diligently, okay? But then look what else he says. Next verb. He says, teach them. And then he says, you shall talk of them. I love this. That means that, yes, there is a time and place for formal instruction, but then there's also just an environment of spiritual conversation. There's formal instruction, no doubt, but then there's also spiritual conversation. Everyday happenings are opportunities to orient our hearts and our children's hearts toward the Lord. The everyday stuff of life becomes an occasion to just engage in spiritual conversation. It doesn't have to be weird. And so I just imagine them going, uh, excuse me, Moses. <laughs> When am I supposed to have time to talk about spiritual conversation with my kids, all right? Those farms are not going to farm themselves, okay? Those cows are not milking themselves. When am I? And he goes, oh, yeah? 
Let me tell you, all right? He goes, I want you to talk to them when you sit down. Are you sitting in your house? That's a great time for spiritual conversation. You're on the dinner table. And it takes nothing just to say, hey, how was your day? How'd it go? And then you just say, how did it go trying to follow God's word in ways? It's not weird. Like, that's, that's who we are, matter of fact, right? Oh, you have a big decision to make? What does God's word say about that, right? I don't, I, I don't know either. Let's Google it. I mean, let's see what the Bible's like. We're just turning our hearts upward. We're bringing God into the conversation. You're sitting down. It's a great time for spiritual conversation. Well, Moses, we don't sit a lot. You don't know my family. We're very busy. We are always on the move. I have soccer, followed by second soccer, followed by hockey, followed by third soccer, followed by swim and dance while playing chess club. He goes, oh, no problem. You got a little commute? That's great. Are you walking on the way? Are you driving in the car? It's a great time for spiritual conversation. You got a captive audience back there, baby. Like, mom, it's not 20 miles per hour. It's like, oh yeah, it is. Spiritual conversation time. Are you walking? Are you on the move? Don't waste the time. Redeem it. Don't waste the time. Redeem it. He goes, oh, you're busy? What about when you lie down? What about when you wake up? That's a great time for spiritual conversation. Does anybody else have this problem? Their kid wants to play 99 questions five minutes before bedtime, right? Yeah, I'm like, hey, how was school today? Good. How you feeling? Fine. Like, what's going on in your mind? Nothing. All right, I guess it's bedtime. Well, actually, <laughs> I was just contemplating the existence of the universe, and I wondered if we are in life, and it was like, what? But dude, guess what, guys? Joke's on them. Because there's your opportunity for spiritual conversation. I don't know, what does the Bible say about that? They think they're keeping you up, and you're like, oh, this is all part of the plan, baby, Right? When you lie down, spiritual conversation. He says, when you wake up, spiritual conversation. As you're getting ready for the day, as you're putting on your clothes to go outside, don't just go over the agenda of your day. What are you going to do today? Go over God's agenda. What does God want us to do today? And so they're putting on their pants. Hey, what are God's two great commandments? Love God, love people. Great, all right. How does the Holy Spirit want us to act? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Rehearse these as you wake up and get ready for the day. You wouldn't send your kids out of the house with no shoes on, would you? Would you? <laughs> right? I, I have been known. My youngest, he's like two, two and a half. And I've gotten phone calls. Hey, your kid is out in the front yard with no shoes on, and he's only wearing a diaper. And the chickens are out there, too. I mean, it's just like, how, he, like he gets out of the fence? What in the world, right? So maybe I would send my kids out without shoes sometimes. But the point is, prepare your kid for the day. Clothes, brush your hair, brush your teeth, put on your clothes. Review God's word and God's ways, okay? He says, when you lie down, when you rise. So teach them formal instruction. Talk about it, spiritual conversation. But then look at the third verb. This is so cool. He says, you shall bind them. You shall bind, again, this is hyperbole. This is metaphor. He's saying, he's saying you, you should be so saturated with scripture. It's like, it's like bind it on your hand, bind it on your forehead, tattoo it on your body. Put it, he, he says here, not just on your forehead and your eyes, put it on the front door of your house. And here's what's so cool about this one. Teaching and conversation, those are inward-facing. Bind them, outward-facing. What he means is, in the spaces that are facing the community, in the spaces where you express yourself to outsiders, handle yourself in such a way that when they come to your gates, when they come to the front door of your life, it is clear to them, I belong to the Lord. I belong to the Lord. Friend, what are the outward facing spaces of your life? Think about it. What are the spaces in which you express and communicate yourself to the world? Social media, the clothes you wear, the, the vocabulary that you use, right? The, the jewelry, the tattoos you have, whatever it is. He's saying, what if you were to redeem the front door of your life to communicate in such a way, I belong to the Lord? Your children will appreciate this conversation so much more if you don't just tell them what to do, but train them how to live for God. You're not allowed to wear that. You're not allowed to do that. You can never get that. You can't post that. How about, why? Hey, hey, how about this? When you post that, when you wear that shirt, when you get that tattoo, when you talk like that, what are you communicating to the rest of the world? Is it that you belong to the Lord? 
that's what we're doing here. We're not, tr- we're not telling them what to do. We're training them how to live. And so even in the outward spaces, we are communicating, I love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. These are signs, outward facing. And so notice here, right? Notice here. Not all of these deal explicitly with children. Admittedly, I, I think I've actually been reading this wrong. Like up until this week when I was prepping it, I've always assumed that children was carried through the whole thing. Teach them to your children, talk with your children, sit with your children, walk with your children, lie with your children, rise with it. But he moves on from the idea of children, and he, and he goes more household, which is okay, because your children will benefit. Even when you're not directly instructing them, they will benefit from a household that is permeated with Scripture. Children don't learn in a classroom. They learn by being immersed into a home where the culture reflects the kingdom of God. We are passing on who we are, not just what we know. So how do we do this, right? Like how do we practically engage in spiritual conversations? I personally didn't grow up in a household where spiritual conversations were smooth. Again, my parents, first-generation Christians, they're doing their best, man. They want to raise people in the faith. But it was a little bit awkward at times, you know? My mom and dad, they love the Lord, but we'd be like hanging out, talking football, it's normal, it's normal. And then it was like, like a manual shift, you know, like, er, now let's talk about God. It was like, oh, you know, just... Like, it was not natural. It was just like an awkward interruption. And so here's the thing. If you're like me and you didn't grow up with that, how else would you know how to do it? How how do you learn how to just have natural, smooth, normal, spiritual conversations? My instinct is, let's buy a book. Let's go to a conference. Let's teach a class. Let's watch a webinar. No, 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 friends. The community of faith passes on the faith. It's through mentorship. It's through modeling. It's through older veterans in the faith who have raised their children, sitting down with young moms and young dads saying, let me show you how we did it in our household. I'll never forget, I was 24 years old, and I remember because my wife was pregnant with our first, and um, I was in seminary, and so I had to go do this like mentored observation once a month, right? So my boy Demetrius, he was an older guy, he has three older kids, and, and we were paired up, he went to my church, and so I would go to his house once a month, and do our mentored study. Talk about theology, questions, how you doing, great. And so I was like, I do, well, looks like you got to do bedtime. Thank you so much, I'll see you next month. And he goes, hey, hey, do you want to stay for family time? I was like, well, I don't know. What? It's, like, it's like family time, that sounds a little private. He goes, no, 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 stay with us. We're going to do our family devos. Just hang out with us, it'll be fun. I've never been part of a family diva. All right, cool, let's try it. And he sits on the couch, and it was just so normal. How's your day going, guys? Oh, good, blah, blah. And they're just talking. I'm like, this is not spiritual, this is just chaos, you know? Yeah, they're just talking. He goes, all right, well, what songs do we want to sing today? And he pulled out a little binder. He had collected all, these, all of their favorite Jesus songs. He goes, I want to read the one about the, or sing the one about the tower. And he goes, all right, let's sing. Ba, 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 ba. And they're singing a the kid's Jesus song. And they're like, all right, next. And I'm like, this is just normal, all right. And then he busts out his Bible with his big book. And he goes, well, where did we leave off? All right, we're in Proverbs 7. And he starts reading about the adulterous woman. You know, I'm like, his kids are nine and six, like his boys. And his daughter's 13. I'm like, is this a rated PG-13 Devo? What has happened? And, he's just, he's just, and he just reads it, and, he just, and then he would pause, and he goes, what does that mean? What does forbidden mean? Well, it means you can't have it. Why is the woman forbidden? It's not his wife. Oh, and he just so casually engaged. And so I share all that with you. My, my point is, you got to see it. you got to see it. That's why we don't have community groups for old people, community groups for young people, community groups for 33 and a half year old people who are single but seriously dating. What? Like, we need all of the community intergenerational because we need the older generation to teach the younger generation how to pass on the faith to the next generation. We need you, senior saints. We need you, Jesus veterans, all right? Coming from a young dad himself, we need you. Older, older Christians, when was the last time you had a younger family over your house with all their kids and their mess and all? And just said, let me show you. When was the last time you went out to coffee with a young dad who's struggling with anger and impatience at how difficult his children are being and just said, dude, how's it going? How's it going passing on the faith? That's me, by the way. Other dads in the room, dude, it's so real right now, isn't it? The way impatience and anger just well up in your hearts and you're like, why will they not obey me? And God's like, nah, you're supposed to teach them to obey me. We need you, older parents. We need you. I need you, man. I need you. We need you. So God calls the community of faith. It takes a village to pass on the faith. 
Last couple of verses here, I want to show you something. What is at risk? What do we risk if we don't prioritize this relay race? Look what he says, last couple of verses. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, when you are enjoying the gifts of God, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The Lord is saying here, take care that the blessings of God don't make you forgetful of God. You see, right now they're standing on the outside of the promised land. And so the promised land is just that. It's only a promise. It's only a wish. It's only something that they're looking forward to. But one day soon, the promise will be fulfilled and God will bring them into the land. They will experience countless blessings that they did not earn for themselves. And the Lord says very clearly, in that day, there is an inherent risk in this setup. In that day, there is a risk that you will forget the Lord. Now understand me, friends, the Lord is not describing personal forgetfulness. He's not saying you're going to forget what happened three weeks ago. No, no, no. Not personal forgetfulness. Generational amnesia. He's saying that it is possible that in the communication, in the, in the transfer of our of earthly provision... As we pass on, as our children inherit the provision, it's possible that they will fail to receive instruction about the provider. There is a possibility here that if we're not careful, that as we give our children the gifts, they will never learn about the gift giver. And so he's saying here, take care. Take care. In the exchange, we can drop our identity-shaping stories of God's work. In the exchange, we can drop the identity of our God. We can stop passing on the stories of how he delivered us from Egypt. We can stop telling the story of how he rescued us from the house of slavery. And when we do that, God will be forgotten within a generation. Read the book of Judges. God saves them. They go, yes, we love you, God. And within a generation, they forgot the Lord. That's what's at risk here. The blessings of God can make us forgetful of God. If we forget the defining stories of our past, our children will never live out their God-given identity in their present cultural moment. Take care. Be diligent. Don't assume that they know the story. Don't assume that they even know how you came to faith. Remember when you first became a Christian, how you were telling the whole world? Have you told your kids? Don't assume that they understand. Don't, don't assume that it's not lost on them, that the creator of the universe has intervened in human history to make sinners friends, to make orphans children, to make outcasts belong. Don't assume. Go to great lengths to make sure that the stories of salvation are not lost in the attic. And how will we make sure that they're not lost in the attic? God calls the community of faith to pass on the faith. Don't assume, friends. May we not assume parents. Let's do what Moses said. Teach it, talk it, bind it, bop it, sing it, he says in Psalm 89. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. There's another one. Friends, they were to tell their children how God delivered them from the house of slavery in Egypt by the hand of his servant Moses. And he said, pass that on. Tell that story. We too have been delivered from the house of slavery, have we not? How many of you have been delivered from the house of slavery? 
How many of you have been freed from addiction and sin and death itself? We, friends, have been delivered not from the house of Egypt, but from the house of death. And we, too, have been saved by the hand of his servant, not Moses. Oh, someone better than Moses. And his name was Jesus. Tell the story. Lest we forget the Lord. Far be it from us to have a beautiful YMCA 30 years from now. And our grandchildren drive by and say, hey, do you know that that's where Mammy and Pappy used to go to church back in the day? That was so cute, wasn't it? Are we building museums? Are we building mausoleums where the faith of yesterday is buried? Or are we building vibrant gospel communities? God calls the community of faith to pass on the faith. The best inheritance we can ever leave our children is the story of what Jesus did for us and how he initiated a relationship with us and he gave us his word and his ways so that we would know how to walk in his presence. And God's going to do it by his grace. Amen? God's going to do it by the faithful community of Jesus followers who depend on one another, who come together as community so that we can grow and see our children grow. Father, we ask you, Father, by your grace and in your mercy, that you would make up, Father, for all the gaps in our parenting. Give us a heart for our children. I, I think of, in the beginning of Luke, Father, one of the signs of revival is that he will turn the hearts of his fathers to the children. Turn our hearts, Lord. May we as fathers not be over preoccupied with other things more than our children. May the most important thing in our lives as parents be you, our own heart, and then our home, and then our community, our externally facing things of our life. Lord, save our children. Holy Spirit, soften their heart. I pray for ripe opportunities for gospel conversation in our home. I pray that the fertile soil in their hearts would be ripe for receiving the seed of the gospel. Holy Spirit, would you work through us as parents and as Sunday school teachers and as youth staff workers and as kids teachers. Father, use us to tell the story. And then you would do the rest, Father. May there be a vibrant, thriving community of Jesus followers for generation upon generation here on the shore. May we not drop the baton, Lord, by your grace. We love you, Father, and we will sing of your, of your love to all generations forever and ever. And the church said, amen.